so you can proceed yeah all right so i hope you're all doing okay and so today uh for the session i'm going to uh, present chapter eight and nine on description and licensing so it's mostly about the um the description file in our R package um oh, okay all right so well i'm pretty sure um you know that every package has to include a description file and as soon as we create a package then we will have this file with this name written inside the um, written inside the uh, package folder and usually there are se just several fields that we have to fill usually of course the name of the, oh, one moment the name of the authors and then afterwards um, what which license that you want to use and so on so today we are going to discuss um, most of the fields that we see in this description file. So if you like to create a lot of packages, then it is possible to put this option in your uh, global art profile so that uh, you don't have to fill the description all the time, especially well, for the authors, it will always be you and you can also put which license that you prefer and also interesting is that the initial version will always be um in the fourth in the fourth significant digit filled with a uh, nine thousand and this indicates um that the, that the package is still in early development version all right, so the most important thing that you can put in the description file is the title and description. Weirdly, the title is actually not the title, but a short description of the package. And usually this is just uh, has to be uh, one line and written with a title case. And then the description is a longer form of the description. So it's um, longer, more detailed. So you can have up to one paragraph to describe what your package is actually doing. All right. And for the uh, author at R, so you can, so what you have here is actually a function. So this is uh, in the utils package, a function for person. So this is for the first name, last name, email, and role. And there are many um, roles that you can fill. I think you can um, type the help, the help documentation for this function. And there are there will be a, um, a various uh, various roles that you can put into this. So I think there's also funder or something like that. But keep in mind that the author should have, the, that every package, every R package should have at least one author and one maintainer. And those two roles can be held by the same person. So if you are, if for example, this is me, then I will put Mikhail Manurong, my email, and uh, for the role, it will be C. And I would put uh, the creator and author uh, in the role field. And you can also put another uh, argument for the author. So you can use a comment for further clarification. I think I saw people use this to fill their ORCID ID. So is the ID that can link you, that can, uh, so it's like an ID, but for a re academic researchers. 
and the you well at first i was not really sure about the distinction between creator and author because they sound the same to me especially the fact that well you're writing code so the one who create the package should be writing the code but then apparently there is a uh, difference so a creator is the one who who have the uh, idea first and then the authors would be those who make significant contributions to the package and there are also ctb which stands for contributors so this is for small contributors to the package um, for example someone fix um, a bug so or for apaches then this will be um, then the role of the person would be the ctb or contributor and and there will and there's also um, copyright holder and we will discuss this in the uh, license section all right so for there's also the URL and bug report that we can fill in the description. And the URL can point you to the GitHub repo or the package downside. And the bug reports is usually the issues page in the GitHub um, repo. All right, and then we have a version so as I mentioned before, the every package that is still in development is um, always have the this um, code number. And if we see here, so there are four fields, uh, four significant digits for the version number. So we have the uh, major, minor, and patch. And whenever we want to increase the version number, we don't have to change it manually. And we can use this function. And very nicely, it asked, it will ask you, okay, what, so what's the magnitude of change that you, uh, that uh, happened to your package? Is it only a minor change or is it only or is it actually a major change? And you can uh, input your answer accordingly. So whenever you're in up, okay, uh, is it um, getting um, an increment in the minor version, in the patch, or even the major version? We can just uh, use this function to uh, determine the newer version number. All right, and now we are, okay, so we have discussed the package, well, the title, version, and then the author field, and the description, and we just slightly bit about the license. And now I think it is also quite important on the imports and suggest field. So what are those? So for the imports, so this should list packages that must be present for your package to work. So if you are um, importing the pipe from Magitor, for example, you can um, you can use import you use Magitor in the uh, import, and of course you can add the package name here. So if you want to add um, another package, just comma and then enter and then write something new. Oops. Hmm. I think I forget to plug my laptop. Just one moment. All right, I'm back. Should be charging, yes. 
Okay, so you can write it manually, or you can also um, use the use this from the use this package. So use package, and you can write the oof, write the name of the package here. For example, tidr, and by default it will put it in the import, or you can also put in the suggest. So if I type that, and now we see the tidr appeared there. So what is actually difference between imports and suggests? So imports are for functions, for packages that has a function that you use very frequently or something, a package that contains a function that is um, central to your package or it will, or if the package is missing, then your package will break. And suggest is usually used for um, it's not necessarily for, I think, if the package contains only one function that is rarely used um, in your package, then you may not necessarily want to include that in the import. So you can just put it in the suggest. And if the, your, if the user of your package wants to use that particular function, and then they can um, eventually install the package. Or also a package that may not actually be used it within um, among your functions. But let's say that you're doing a, a data analysis and yeah, you, not, you need um, other packages uh, within that environment so that you can do the whole workflow of data analysis, then you can put those packages in the suggest. So if you're, if in your package you have a vignette, then the packages that are needed for, uh, for the vignette will be in the suggest field. And for the imports, um, so after you put it here, then if you want to uh, use the function in your package, you can use um, this uh, double uh, column. But if I'm not mistaken, this comes at a performance cost. I think it's like a few microsecond uh, extra time that is needed to access this function. So if, if you are only using it once or twice, then uh, maybe you can use it. But if you're using it all the time, then, then you can use this instead. So it's um, at input from a package and a function. So for example, import from deployer pivot longer. I think that's one example. So all right, okay, and I have shown this to you as well. Mm -hmm. And, okay. All right, and for the dependencies, you can also put a version number here. And it is recommended rather than specifying the exact version of um, a package, then you can just put at least um, the minimum version that is required so that your package can function as well. And well, this is an example. And that is also one interesting thing is that, so in the depends field, you can choose, um, you can set the minimum version of R, but if you still, but then if you, um, if you set this, then your user of, and the, and the user of your package still has, I don't know, R.3.2.1, then he or she will not be able to install your package. And not only that, if he or she wants to install your package, he has to install um, R and it will be, 
longer, maybe that person will be put off um, and not will not install your uh, package instead. So if the reason why you want to use this uh, minimal version of your R is because you want to use a function that is implemented in the newer R version, you can actually use this uh, backports package that has that that implements functions from R, I think starting from R.3.3. And therefore you, if the reason why you want to use the newer R version is because in the older R version, there is this function that hasn't been implemented yet, you can use this uh, backports uh, package instead. Well, actually for the description field, that's it. And before we are moving on to the license, is there any um, maybe questions or comments from you? Just a quick question. I can probably look it up, but I don't know if you know offhand, but on the use package, if you want to make it a suggest, is there an argument? Yes. Um, um, so, um, let's say, hmm, I don't know what type reader type suggests. Ah, okay, that makes sense. I'm just yes, now we say it. can even be with it, it don't need to have the, the capital letter. It, it, it uses okay. both. Well, good to know. Yeah, so yeah, that's it. All right. Oops, oops. Okay. Okay. Now for the license. This is actually my first time uh, reading up on the license. So it seems like there are a lot um, to be read, but yeah. So for the license, there are basically two major camps. So the first camp is the per permissive camp. So this includes the MIT license. So, and this, the signature of these camps is that if you use this license, then the code can be freely copied, modified and published as long as the license is preserved. So for example, if you use, uh, if you copy a repo that is using the MIT license and you change it to something else, then you still have to use the MIT license regardless um, of what you uh, have. And there's also the copy left. I'm not entirely sure why it's named this. I mean, um, it's like a referral to copyright, but yeah, actually, the, the like, copy left is the one that you need to to copy the entire license to your own code. If you use something that is like, for example, GPL three, you have to your code needs to be GPL three. That is that is the copy thing, the copy. And, and um, if you send your code to someone, you need to copy the license. And, and, and send the license together with the code to someone. If your code, um, if, if your software includes GPL3 code, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, actually the MIT, for example, you don't need to copy the, the, the license. You can send your code to someone and, and just say, it uses MIT license and it was written by Mikael, you, you don't need to copy the entire license to your code, for example. That, 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 uh, I think that's the cop part of the copyleft um, license. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah. thanks, Lucio. But my biggest question is actually, why do they have to invent, well, I would say a new word to describe what they want uh, in the license? I mean, is it a homage to copyright? but not really copyright. 
Yeah, actually, the the, the open source licensing okay. um, aspect so, is the really sensible sensible area, and, and it's also a, like a, a legal area. I'm not a lawyer, so I, I will give my <laughs> my perspective on, on that. Um, is that um, if you if you use code for example if you call an R code that, that that uses MIT that there is licensed as MIT you don't actually need to use MIT license in your code you just have to say that you use it something that's MIT and the GPL for example you need to use a GPL license if you if you derive it something from a GPL code. That's the main difference. Mm. So it's MIT still... is not mm. copyleft, for example. MIT is, is open source. It's um, but but you can derive code written in MIT for to something that is not open source. You can write a a, a, pet, a patent using MIT code, but you can't write a, a patent using GPL code, for example. All right, so it's just like copyright, but it's still free. I mean, other people can use your code for yeah, free. Yeah, this, this, is, this is also a con confusing part because both of them are free. Both of them you can use for free. You can yeah. distribute for free, but if you, if you derive it code, the GPL code, you need it to also be free. The MIT code, you don't need, you, you are not obligated to be free if you derive it from a, a free code written in the MIT license. Right. That, that's the biggest difference. Yeah. Well, I guess they have to be really specific for this kind of uh, law terms. I don't know. But yeah, and, yeah. and, and actually, um, if it's free or not, if you can distribute or not, actually changes between languages because um, it's actually a, like a kind of, uh, a, there is a debate on that area because actually in R, when you send your code to someone, you are actually just, just sending the source code. You are not sending um, the compiled version of code. So you can send a code that is written um, in MIT, in GPL, we, without it actually being the software, it's just the soft, source code for the person to compile it in, in, in their own machine. For example, if you are sending C code that is already compiled, it's a, it's a, there is a different perspective on if you can use MIT, if you can use it. It's, um, it's actually much more complex than, than just say you, you can yeah. copy or not the code. <laughs> I think there is a whole book um, on licensing by Colin Fay, right? It's a uh, link in the chapter. Yeah, I mean, even this one section in the R Packages book is it's a lot. But anyway, um, yeah, so I think the three main licenses that we should know uh, for the package are the MIT. GPL and CC0. Uh, and I think um, Lucio has nicely explained the distinction between MIT and GPL before. And that is also this um, CC0 license in which if you use this license, then we are completely relinquishing any rights whatsoever for the function, for the package. So such that anyone can use it for any purpose and they are, are free to do anything and relicense with whatever uh, they want to um, accept. And of course, if you're not really sure which license that you should use, you can uh, use, you can go to this link. And please note if you want to submit your package to um, to CRAN, then they also have uh, 
types of licenses that they would consider valid. So you should always um, check. But with all these, with these three type of licenses, I think it will cover most of the use cases and you will be safe with it. And as always, use this has a function to fill the uh, license field in your description file. So use um, start license and you can replace the asterisk here with any license that you want. So you can use MIT, GPL2, CC0. So you can just try this. All right. And so if you're if you're thinking about okay, which license would you want to uh, set for a package? then actually the one who's allowed to do that may not necessarily be you. The one who can set the copyright, the license is or are only the copyright holders. So if we are writing the code in our own time, then without a doubt, then we will be the sole copyright holder. And if you write code uh, for your employer, Maybe you um, you write the code as a part of your work, then the copyright holder will actually be your employer. But then, of course, it depends on what kind of contract or the policy that you have in uh, the place that you're working at. And if you write a code for contract work, so the copyright holder will be you, unless they did otherwise in the contract. And what would happen if there are multiple authors? Well, there will be multiple copyright holders. And it's not like a board uh, where everything discussed um, for the whole set of the package. Um, if they want to uh, relicense or change something uh, with the package. But each individual, each copyright holder will hold copyright for their specific contribution. All right, and these are the um, most commonly used licenses running from the most to least permissive. So again, we have the, uh, M the MIT license and if we see in our package folder, let me see. Okay, so we have a description, and here we have the type of uh, license and also a state uh, like file license. And we can open that file. So we have the license file here, and this will be the whole uh, content of the MIT license. And within the license file without the .md, then it will um, also list, okay, so in what year um, the license was made and who are the copyright holder for this package. And I think this is, this will be generated automatically in accordance to your description file. All right, and then, so we have the MIT, which is uh, very permissive. And we have the um, Apache, we have the, um, this GNU lesser general public license. Well, I'm, I don't really understand or know the distinction between uh, all this, um, to licenses, but there is, so for the GNU general public license or GPL, there are two versions of it, GPL2 and GPL3. I think, so it says that the GPL3 actually covers up for some loopholes in GPL2. So, well, um, I think from this, 
it is uh, sort of suggesting that we should not use GPL2 anymore, but start, but just use GPL3 from uh, now on. Because, well, if there are loopholes and in this uh, old license, well, would you want still to still use that? And the least permissive of all the licenses in this list is the Acero GPL. So it in this license, it really defines um, the distribution of your code in a stricter manner. Okay, so those are the license for your um, package for your functions. But however, if your package is a data package, then you should actually use a different license. And so there are um, two licenses. So in general, I think. So you have the Creative Commons. So and also the CCBY. So I think for Creative um, Commons is just you you're releasing your um, your data to the public and that's it, everyone can use it. Because I think depending on the country, you can or cannot um, hold ownership to the data, but not sure about that. And there is also the CCBY. So every everyone who's using your data package must credit the author of the uh, data package. All right, now this is becoming a bit messy about licensing. So I think the basic idea is that, well, if you're working alone, then you can do whatever you want because you are the sole copyright holder um, to the package. However, if you are uh, working with someone else, then I think I would say this part is a common courtesy. The basic courtesy that you can do is to check with all copyright holders. And for the codes that are given to you, then uh, they are actually agreeing to your uh, license. I think this will this includes a uh, pull request as or someone uh, watching over your repo and they're yeah they're making a pull request to fix something or to add a new feature. Then by adding something to your um, package, then they are implicitly agreeing to whatever license that you have. But of course, you as the um, copyright holder should always acknowledge um, the contributors, but not necessarily have to sort of obey them if you want to pre-license um, your package because contributors doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a copyright holder to your package. Okay. And to be honest about the bundling external code, yeah, I'm just, it, it would be just really a reading of the slide. I don't really uh, know what uh, they are actually in the practical sense. So the idea is just to make sure whether the license, your license, and the license of the external code has the same uh, restriction or permissiveness. And so of course, if the license are the same in terms of the permissiveness, then you can just um, do nothing. Or especially, or in particular, if the external license is MIT or I'm not sure, uh, what BSD stands for, then you can just um, do nothing. 
All right. And if you want to include external code, but then the license is more restricted, so there are several options that you can do. So either you make your license more restrictive because you have to comply with their restriction, or just try to find another code that doesn't have to uh, give you all this hassle to get this uh, stricter license. Yeah. Or another possibility is that you can take that particular chunk of code and put them in a separate package with different license. So then I think this is um, quite a nice solution because you, well, maybe there are not that uh, many uh, variants of the code with varying um, permissiveness or strictness of the license. So you can just still use that code and you don't have to relicense the rest of your um, package just because you want to include this, maybe this um, a tiny function in your package. So this is a licensing story from a last cohort that I haven't uh, really looked into, to be honest. So they are, it seems like it's, it's not a, it, it's nothing surprising if we are confused with all these licenses because there seems to be uh, many interesting stories out there about um, licensing, especially with, uh, with all this open source community that maybe we are active in. Um, of course, every, every code is out there in the uh, public domain, everyone can see, everyone can use, but proper attribution uh, would be uh, very, very important. And yes, I think the, well, what I can learn from all of this is if you're taking code from someone else, just be, I don't know, just be a good human being, just make sure with them. So what are the licenses? I think proper communication would uh, prevent a lot of hitting. So, okay, that's actually it for this week. Is there any uh, function, uh, function? Is there any question or comment from all of you? Feel free. Good job. Uh, that was I, a tough I one. always like to highlight in this part of um, of lies that actually, if, if you just search on the internet, there is a lot of mixed stuff, especially because R and and actually all of the compiled languages like Python, Perl, R, R, they they actually uh, live in a totally different world from the compiled languages. For example, in Java or C, if you build your code, for example, if there is a C library that is like reader that read a CSV file and you include that in your code, um, since it's a compiled code, you need to compile it the role code, the role code of the of the library that reads CSV. And so your bundled code actually includes the that that's the part of external code that you are mentioning. And for, like, for example, Java or C, you need to license your code according to the distribution of the code that it's bundled. But science, Python, and I just call the code for you. You have your code there. And you, you just call read CSV from the reader library. You are not including code from the, the read CSV library. So you, you don't, you, you are not include, including in your distribute. The, and, and, and it's also important to define the, dis, the distribution term because if you distribute your code, 
you are not distributing the the read the reader package. You are you are just distributing your code that calls the reader package. If the person don't have the reader package installed, the only thing that will happen is that your code will not work. But you you can send your code to someone even if the reader package can't be installed in the person's computer or if the country of the person don't allow them to, to install the radar package, things like that. Also, um, especially in the copyright law actually changes a lot between, between countries. So what's allowed in one country actually is not allowed in another, especially when you go to the CC0 or CCBI licenses, they are licenses that actually address um, auto rights. Um, and, and, and this also changes a lot between countries. Most countries have specific laws about um, writers and auto ownership of, if you write a book, if you write an essay, you are the author of that, that piece of uh, written knowledge. And most countries actually acknowledge that to code. If you write a piece of code, it could be in, in your own notebook or in your computer, you are the owner of that piece of written knowledge that you wrote there. And this is the ownership, the authorship of the code. But when you distribute your code is another word. Most of the auto license, that is the CC, BUI, CC0 don't, have anything addressing the distribution of code. And that is the importance of the, of the specific uh, software license because the software license have really strict rules about how you can distribute your code, who is allowed to use your code, who, who can redistribute your code, what the person needs to do if they are going to redistribute your code. And that, 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 that's a big difference between uh, when you are writing your code and when you are distributing the code. And actually there is a, a specific uh, thing that is actually in R, most of the time you are not distributing your code. If you are sending your code to Chrome, actually Chrome is distributing, distributing your code. So you, you need, so that, that's why Chrome have really strict rules about which which kind of license is allowed because they, uh, they, they are distributing a code that is written by other person, that the other person is the, is the mm. owner of the code, that is the, the author of the code. So it's, it's a legal question most of the time. <laughs> All right, so it's not another nitpicking then. Okay. Good to know. So that mm. they the first thing to do if, is actually like, like you addressed, if you work for somebody and you're writing code for somebody, actually try to reach the Lego department. <laughs> That's the first thing to do. Especially if, if you are using code and derived from other code that was written from other persons. That's really important. And, and actually in the academic area, most universities ha have really strict, um, strict guidelines of what kind of licenses you can use, who can use your code, things like that. Yeah, that's true. Even for um, a lab notebook, so it's uh, basically a book in which you scribble everything that you did during your uh, PhD or lab work. It, it will be actually the property of the university, not you. So I find that, okay, who's actually going to rip this garbage that I'm writing? <laughs> but I think. Yeah, that, 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 that's the part of the authorship. Because actually, if you are writing a piece of paper, but during your work time, uh, your employer can say that it's their poor property and not actually yours. There's... Exactly. And, and like yeah. I said, it, it, it actually changes a lot between countries, between companies, between mm -hmm. working environments. So most of the time it's a, it's a Lego <laughs> question to address. That is true. Yeah. 
I think I uh well I uh, notice these licenses everywhere because it's always in every GitHub repo, but I don't really understand the distinction between CC0, CCBY, or MIT, and so on. But if, I think yeah, if I'm not, if I'm not, that yeah. the CCBY, you will find it in a lot of things that aren't code. You will find it in Wikipedia, in like a blog post, because it, it's actually addressing the authorship of the, of the written knowledge. And and then, for example, the MIT code it's just addressing the code, the software properties of mm -hmm. of that written knowledge. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. So, um, who's presenting next week? It will be Kevin, isn't it? Yes, and I have a question mark, but I think I forgot to, I was looking at that this morning and I forgot to take off the question mark, but I'll be able to present next week. All right, okay, great. Uh, I, I would like also to, to point another thing that it's kind of curious in the, our community that is nowadays there is a lot of, I would say like a kind of pressure, especially if you read this, the art package books and the other things that are uh, done by the art studio community. Because they mm -hmm. are, are, if you just follow the open source community, you, you will see that most of the things are actually using the, the GPL license. Because the, they, they, they say that the GPL license is that thing that is actually a virus. Because anything that uses GPL needs to be GPL and, and it, it spreads like a, a, a virus. But in the R community, you are seeing a lot of, most of the packages are migrating to the MIT license. And the MIT license is actually a license that allows people to derive actually um, closed source, not, not closed source, but uh, um, closed functionality, I would say. Like you, you can write a patent on code derived from MIT. You can build a... Um, a company that uses code derived from MIT, and it's I would say in the data data science community that there is a, a migration to the to the MIT license mm -hmm. much more than the GPL license. If you if you follow most of the R package and Python package libraries, I would say. Yeah, I would I would guess. Uh, packages like Shiny would have the MIT license, right? Because I think many companies use a Shiny as their product. So, because I think if you use MIT license that you can use the code and the code derived from it doesn't have to be open source. Yeah. Actually for the Shiny specifically, it's kind of a gray area cause like I said, if you, if you, create code and create a website that uses Shiny, you don't need to use um, any any license. You can, you can use whatever license that you want because actually you're not distributing the Shine code. You're, you're mm. distributing the, your code that you wrote that actually calls Shiny. And it could be whatever you want. Shiny is GPL3, I just checked. Yeah. Yeah, I just also yeah. opened it. For example, uh, when you you would need to use G the GPL code if you use Shine, Shine is if you create a desktop application that ah. has the role Shine code bundled on it. That, for example, the person could could download the entire package and just run an um, executable and exe file on their Windows machine. These would need to be GPL, GPL3, for example. Mm, I see. Because you are distributing the Shine code together with, with your code. For example, if you bundle the R code, for example, you download from the R uh, project website, the R4.0.3 code and, send, and sells it to someone together with your package, you need your package to be GPL3 together. And you need to tell everyone that you're using 
é GPL, Code, enfim, aí eu, actually, you can sell, that, that's also a common misconception about open source license, that, because if you do that, if you sell to someone, they are code with your package, you can actually sell that, but, but you need to, add, to have written everywhere that you're using GPL code, that you are not the owner of the code, that you are addressing who is the actual owner. You can sell, but you, you cannot say that the code is yours. So. <laughs> it's complex. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is. Yeah. Well, if it is simple, then lawyers will be out of work. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I just, <laughs> yeah. All right. But I, but I have actually studied a lot, a lot of patent and patent writing stuff, so I actually concerned about <laughs> those stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it is very important to know, but especially because most of the people just address those questions after they have already written written the code. They already have the code, they already have the functionality, and, and after that they say, oh, now I can build the company, and now I can write a page, and now I want to sell, sell the code. And, and especially in the R community, if you are just following the, those guidelines from the RPG book, for example, you would already have your code as MIT or or something like that. And after that, you would address oh, what I need to do. <laughs> <laughs> and most of the time, you, you would be already screwed because the code would be already on GitHub. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, it's nice that there's private GitHub people. And that's next week, uh, what is it about? I forget. Data and external files. All right, cool. I use that a lot. I was gonna say, I already learned, <laughs> I already learned some stuff, checking it out oh. this morning. So I'm like, oh, I should be doing that. Nice. <laughs> So awesome. Yeah, yeah that, that is a, a nice chapter here. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right then. So well, I guess we are really um, uh right on time. Yeah. All right. Good job. I learned a lot. <laughs> oh good, yeah. It's, more yeah, than when it started. <laughs> That's the important thing. <laughs> yeah, if, if you just want to support the open source community, use GPL3. That's the, <laughs> that's the, the lesson. All right, but then. You, okay. Yeah, if, if, you, if you think about business, use MIT. That's the point. <laughs> okay, then. Well... I also learned a lot from uh, from you guys. So I think we can end for today. So see you next session. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks Bye. a lot. Thank you, Michael.